Anin, Bujo, Wabnan Anangonque and Dishnakas, Addict Dodum, Obishko Kang and Dunjaba, Niagara and Dunjaba, Ojibwe, Anishinaabe Quayandao. So I give you my name. My name is Patty Crowick. And then I situate myself in my clan, which is Caribou. And then the places where I'm from, so which would be Obishko Kang, the place of the White Pine Narrows or Lac Soul First Nation, as well as Niagara. And then I tell you my broader community, which is Anishinaabekwe. I'm an Ojibwe woman. Through my father, I belong to Lac Soul First Nation. The Ojibwe people living far north of Lake Superior basically get to Thunder Bay, turn right, drive for another five hours, and that's where you get to the place where my father's people emerged. Through my mother, I come from German and Ukrainian migrants and refugees who first left Stalin's Russia for Germany and then left Germany for Canada after the Second World War. So within me, I carry both of these heritages. I carry the lineage of the original people of this place, as well as the people who found safety by coming to this place. And so I think a lot about those relationships that we inherit and what does it mean to be in good relationship. Because, of course, my father's family is only from Lac Soul First Nation because that's where Canada put them before Canada decided to take over the lands of governed under Treaties 3 and Treaty 9 in northwestern Ontario, my father's people would have just lived all over the place, moving around kind of like my oldest son did for a few years when he worked at forest firefighting and tree planting and you know, doing all of that seasonal work. My father's people, too, would have done seasonal work, moving around with the caribou and with the wild rice and the other things that they were harvesting. And so we're only from Lac Soul First Nation because that's where the government put us so that my mother's family and other people like them could find safety in this place. So I think about relationships a lot. I think about reconciling these relationships. And what does truth and reconciliation really mean in Canada when we're putting together Indigenous people and those who are trying to live here? And I've thought for a long time about what it would be like to stand in front of this church. Because, of course, Gary and I used to come here. We started coming here when you guys were still in the vineyards. And then we came with you into St. Catharines. And Gary and our oldest son were both involved in the renovations of this building. Myself, my parents, and our boys have all been involved in helping out with the shelter. So I've often thought about what it would be like to be here in front of you. Because I admire the work that you guys do at each of your locations. And I admire the work that many of you are willing to do in examining your relationships with the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples who lived here long before there even was a St. Catharines. One of the things that I valued when I helped out at the shelter was the willingness of many of the volunteers to sit and eat with the residents rather than just stand behind tables. Because something really important happens when we sit together and share a meal, even if some around us might complain or mutter about who we're spending time with. In response to such a complaint or a muttering of this man welcomes sinners and eats with them, Jesus tells three parables about increasingly careless people. Jessica Price is the Jewish author of the Better Parables blog, and Amy Jill Levine is a Jewish scholar of New Testament history. And I rely heavily on both of them for the way I read these stories. And they both note that these are stories are a trilogy, and they should be read that way. First, we have a man with a hundred sheep who loses one. Then we have the woman with 10 coins who loses one. And finally, we come to the father with two sons who arguably loses them both. And although in all three stories, the central figures, the shepherd, the woman, and the father all invite their friends to share a meal and celebrate, the man who can arrange for catering and musicians doesn't send anyone to get the oldest son so he can come to the party. We read this third parable in the context of the first two. And Jesus does spend most of his time with this story of his father and and the two sons. But he doesn't just jump into it. He responds to a complaint about his own dinner parties by telling three stories of people who celebrate finding what they had lost by having a party, the shepherd, the woman, and the father. We get hung up on the actions of the two sons. We focus on the younger son asking for his inheritance as if that was a big insult. But Jessica Price points out that if it was such a big insult, why would the Jewish law have a policy and a practice for the way that they do this? This was just something that they did. Or we focus on the older son who appears ungracious 
What changes if we focus on the Father, that third in a series of increasingly careless people? The shepherd who lost a sheep, one out of a hundred. Not too bad, sheep stray. The woman lost a coin, one out of ten. But what was she doing having all of those coins out? Was she showing off a little bit, maybe? And then the father, who lost the only sons he had. The Anishinaabe also have a story of a lost relationship that ended with a dinner party. In this story, the Anishinaabe mistreated and exploited their relationship with the deer. Perhaps they took more than they should have. Perhaps they didn't take care of the forest in a way that made it a good place for the deer to live. The way that we understand our creation story, each layer of creation promises to care for what comes next. And then these become reciprocal relationships. The land and waters and all they contain promise to care for us. And in return, we care back. So it must have been a serious thing for the deer to turn their backs on a promise of care. But in the story, the Anishinaabe, like the central figures in Jesus's parables, had become careless. And perhaps the deer decided that with their existence threatened, they may not be here to keep their promises anyway. And of course, the deer's decision to leave the territory had consequences for other animals. The people still needed to prepare for winter, which may have posed a threat. In the story, the Anishinaabeg spent the winter thinking about what they had done. So by the time it was spring, they were a changed people. They had learned humility, that recognition that we exist in a network of relationships and that we are accountable to those relationships. They once again sent out runners to look for the deer, and when they found them, the Anishinaabe were ready to listen, not to speak pretty words of apology and moving on, but listening to the things that they needed to hear so that they could have a restored and transformed relationship. In this story, they sent their leaders and their head people to meet with the deer, and as they shared food and warmth, the people listened. They listened for as long as the deer needed to speak. In our stories of increasingly careless people, the shepherd and the woman work ruthlessly to search out that which they had lost, and having found it, they rejoiced with their friends. The Anishinaabe, after realizing what they had done, also took steps to seek out what they had lost. But the father did not. The father who lost two sons did not go searching for his younger son, and he remained oblivious to the harms that he had caused the older son. What more do you want, he says. Everything I have belongs to you, he says, against the backdrop of a party bankrolled by the older son's inheritance, a party to which he hadn't even invited the older son. What more do you want? Against the backdrop of a party bankrolled by the dispossession and displacement of Indigenous people, Canada offers Indigenous people a place on the stage and land acknowledgments and then responds to calls to justice with, what more do you want? Jesus told these stories in response to a muttering about relationships, a muttering about the invitations he accepted and the people that he spent time with. So he told three stories, two of which ended in a celebration of restored relationship, and one of which ended with, what more do you want? Restoring and building these kinds of relationships between people is more complicated than restoring relationships between a shepherd and his lost sheep, or a woman and her lost coin, which is probably why Jesus spent the most time with it. Whether we're talking about the church's relationship with indigenous people, or simply about the relationships between us, we want to make it simple. We want to say we're sorry and have it be okay. But the Anishinaabe had to spend a long winter returning to themselves. The shepherd had to retrace his steps. The woman had to shine light into dark corners and sweep out her house. How we read ourselves into the story is important because we're always there in the stories, but it changes depending on the circumstances. It's beautiful to think of ourselves as the younger son coming to our senses and begging forgiveness from God. But for all his pretty words, there is no repentance on his part. His epiphany is rooted in lost riches, not an admission of guilt. My father's hired servants have food to spare, so I'm going to go home and say... It's inspiring to think of ourselves as the father, graciously accepting the apologies of those who have wronged us. But where is his searching and rooting out of his own wrongdoing? And what of the older son, 
What of those who have been wronged, whose anger is not meant with listening, but with accusation? What more do you want? There is something powerful about sitting down and sharing a meal together, particularly when we're celebrating a restored relationship. People may even mutter about who we spend time with. But we've also sat through those awkward meals when key people were arguing or noticed an empty seat. So before we can celebrate a reconciled relationship, we need to do the work of reconciling. The winter work that the Anishinaabe did is hard. Listening to familiar stories and hearing them differently as we become increasingly aware of the wrongs that were done and the unintended consequences of carelessness is hard. We don't like to think of ourselves as the bad guys. We each have a story that we tell about ourselves as a church and as individuals, and anything that threatens that story is threatening. Like the father in this parable, we don't want to hear it. We respond beautifully to the son who says the things we long to hear and then turn to the other with what more do you want, which only makes the space between us bigger and more daunting. Instead of asking what more do we want, we should be asking, as the Anishinaabe surely did in that story, what do you need? That's the work of sitting down and listening to those we have wronged, not pretty apologies and promises of doing better but asking them, what do you need? And being prepared to hear the answer. Ambe, let's go. <laughs>